welcome to another episode of the That's My Dad podcast. I'm here today with Jerome Thomas. Jerome is a very special friend to me. Have been, we were talking since 1993, we think. Yep. Yep. Uh, back in the days when Eagle Rock Boys Ranch was just getting open. And Deanna and I had been married six months when the ranch <laughs> opened. And uh, it was tough, man. I'm yeah. telling you, it, those were some tough days. And we had we had one guy helping us, and then he was with us for about uh, two and a half years, I think, to get started. And then Deanna and I took over full time, and we lived in the house with the kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and both of us had a job. Right. So there was no way to get away. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And – Jerome, you and your wife, Kathy, who's in here in the studio with us today, uh, were so kind and and just will always hold a special place in mine and Deanna's heart because you stepped in and said, look, you guys, go go out to eat. Or a couple yeah. times we we went and spent the night in a hotel just to get away. And, man, you you saved us. Our, men, our mental health was saved because of you guys. So you'll always carry a special place in my heart so it was a joy then to raise our kids together and uh and you and they eventually ended up getting to go to high school together and we went to church together but you also served at eagle rock in a lot of capacities you mentored kids for us uh and you were on our board of directors and then you became chairman of the board of directors for several years and since i've retired they've asked you to come back and be on the board so excited um, to be there I always, I always love to tell this story about you, Jerome. Oh, no. though. You know what I'm going to tell. Uh, there was a guy, <laughs> there was a guy broke into a store, oh, yeah. uh, close to his house, and it was in the middle of the night, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you heard the guy, yep. and you go out there, and the poor guy's trying to steal food or whatever from this little mm-hmm. quick shop, and you. You did a citizen's arrest on him, <laughs> didn't you? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the story is that you had the guy pinned up against the wall with a bayonet. Yes. And you're calling the, the police, right. waiting on them to come and get him. The, yes. I can just imagine the, the oh, how the God. poor guy must have felt. It was, it was um, an experience. I, I, uh, f- I fired a round off in the air as a warning shot because he took off running and Kathy heard the uh, the shot and called the sheriff's department, and somehow or another they made it there in record breaking time because we live in the middle of nowhere. And in the meantime, the guy was trying to get around me, and and I didn't know if he had help because there was his van parked there, and so I just pulled popped the bayonet out on the rifle there and just kind of charged him <laughs> with it <laughs> and pinned guy. him against the uh, gas pump. And, um, <laughs> He was one of these guys that was going. He had to had to hold his trousers up, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, he put his hands up, and he uh, he was full command. That's all I can say there. It's kind of funny when the deputy rolled up. He, I'm sitting there screaming at him with a rifle, and he's standing there like this, and he had a language problem barrier there. And, yeah, and, so, and so I deputy think deputy almost busted. <laughs> I just dropped my rifle on my shoulder and stepped back. So, and, so I think we made a joke of it because you were kind of, you didn't tell yeah. anybody. We found out somehow, yeah. and I think we all started calling you Mister Citizens Arrest or something like that. <laughs> Marty Five, Marty yeah. Five, Citizens Arrest, yes, Citizens yes. Arrest. Yes, but uh, unfortunately, true. Jerome's a uh, Jerome's an interesting guy because uh, you know he's he's a tough tough cookie. You grew up in a. Uh, sort of a tough part of town. Yeah. And I, I want to yeah. tell this because, you know, we got guys that I'm hoping are, are listening and watching are, are looking and they're saying, oh, look at these two old white guys. But I'm going to tell you what, this white guy here is one more tough cookie. Mm-hmm. There was w- one night a bunch of guys jumped you at the at the football stadium, I remember. And, yes, that and was. They, uh, you broke out on a little k- kung fu theater on them, didn't you? Uh, yeah, that was kind of a <laughs> so, situation where I – Honestly, felt like I might actually would kill somebody that yeah. night, and I uh, scared them, scared them, and uh, scared them off basically. And then I guess the adrenaline rush took over then, and I'll, I scared myself because yeah. I realized how close I got to really losing it. Of course, you know, growing up without a father, um, I had a lot of rage issues. Man, it was mm-hmm. this, the rage was just right under the surface, and I remember as a kid. It didn't take much for me to for that to break out, 
Yeah. Uh, that was that was a problem for me for a while. Yeah, it was. Yeah, you, but you know, God delivered me from that, and I'm pretty chill now. So. <laughs> so you had you had a sort of a sad childhood in some ways. I don't yeah. think you would classify it as that, but people looking from from my perspective, yeah. t- tell me about that experience from. Um, I am the oldest in my family. Uh, I have two younger siblings, two two sisters. Um, my father died when I was six, and they were two years, each one of them younger than me. And then I've got some stepbrother and sisters, but I, I didn't grow up with them. I didn't really have any experience with them until after I was an adult. But my mom is uh, crippled. You know, she's mm-hmm. handicapped, and that's back in the days when you didn't have to hire the handicapped. So she may do as best she could trying to raise three kids, um, cleaning the houses, doing seamstress, seamstress work, and um, it was tough. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it, we were poor. I, I mm-hmm. didn't really realize at the time how poor we were, but we were. and But we were a family unit, and we were pretty tight, I think, um, when – when my father passed, um, that flip, flipped the script on me. Um, mm-hmm. I went from a very uh, comfortable, safe environment um, to one that I was just, uh, I was mad. I was angry, maybe angry at God, you know. And, mm-hmm. and um, it just, it affected me in a lot of weird ways. I mean, I started sleepwalking, you know, and yeah. waking up in various parts of the house and, one night, I think you they found you down the street, didn't they? Yeah, I did. In I went outside, night. knocking on doors in the middle of the night, trying to find my dad. You know, it was just a traumatic thing, and it took a while yeah. for me to get past that. But I did. You, you told me you didn't. You don't think you really dealt with it as a little kid. You just you deal with it, but you don't deal with it. Right. Does that, that makes sense? Yeah, Stop. it was. It's always bubbling at the surface, even as a teenager. You know, it would it would act out and. Fits of rage sometimes. Um, I, n- I never struck my mother or my sisters or anything, but I, you know, I, I would, I'd be, I knew I had a problem with anger. I knew it, and, and, and it's, uh, it was a problem. So t- take me back and take the listeners back to the, the process of actually losing your dad. You didn't know that that was going to happen. No, we didn't. Um, uh, it happened suddenly. He, uh, my dad was my hero. He was. I mean, if I could share a little with that, he yeah. he was a, a in the navy war veteran. Um, he came home injured. I saw a purple heart. You know, he had earned it, and, mm. and um, I, he was also like a early member of the Ottawa County Rescue Squad. He, I remember that orange jumpsuit and that helmet and uh, deputy sheriff. And you know, to me. He was my hero, you know, but but he uh, he got ill. He had he had cancer. He smoked when he was in the military, and and uh, he developed lung cancer, and uh, was kind of a guinea pig back in the early '60s for the treatments they were doing for for cancer back in those days. And um, he, uh, uh, I remember the night he got ill, and the night they took him by ambulance away and then he was gone for like a month and then um i don't know how but my uh, my mother and my aunt took me to see him at the va hospital um i don't know if they knew he was dying um i thought he was recovering because i they took me in his room and it's such a clear memory to me you know i'm sick this was what 56 years ago you know and so um set me up on the bed he talked to me showed me this neat new zipper they had just put into the front of his chest you mm-hmm. know and and uh we talked a few minutes and then um i told him goodbye and it's the last i saw him you know the, growing up uh man and my mom she is I can't say enough about her, you know. She uh, she would say I don't call her enough nowadays, mm-hmm. but she's still living independently, you know. Mm-hmm. She's got a multitude of medical problems, and um, but she's a survivor, and she's 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 done wonderful. So, know? so as a six year old, you kind of had to start finding your own way. 
You all yeah. almost had to step up and be the man of the house, I think. Yeah, you know, as much as a six-year-old can, um, but it it was tough. It was Growing up was tough. Um, yeah. It was. Thinking about tonight, I was like, I wrote down actually every every memory I have of him, and it's only like 12. They're very clear. Yeah, and it's been 56 Six years. years. Tell, let's hear some of those. I'm interested <laughs> yeah. in that. Uh, some of the uh, memories I have that are very clear usually involved me getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. So uh, my dad had a small trucking concern. He had like three trucks he was running, and and I remember he would take me on some of his trips locally, and I would be in the sleeper box looking over his shoulder, and we had to go somewhere. And um, now I'm six, but I can. This is clear as a bell to me. Um, we pulled up to this stop, and he specifically told me to sit still. And of course, I'm not. Mm. <laughs> and he uh, he gets out of the truck, and uh, he starts to walk around. I immediately run over and grab hold of the steering wheel, and I'm playing with the steering wheel. And I look up, and I see this string going up through here, and I grab it and pull on it, and those air horns go <laughs> off, and he is right dead in front of the truck. And, you know, he throws both hands up and jumps and spins around, looks at me, and I'm like, I'm dead. <laughs> you know? um, That's a great memory. That, oh, my gosh, It's funny yeah. to me that you that you remember things like that, oh, but, yes. man, I can only imagine the look on his face. Oh, my God. And I knew I was cooked. But <laughs> fortunately, um, I, he barely mentioned it when he got back. Another time in a vehicle, we he was a he was a deputy sheriff, so he had a little rotating red light he would put on top of the car, and had a little siren in the floor, and I was just intrigued by all that. So he pulled up and stopped, and again, sit still. And again, of course, I didn't. And uh, I ran over there, and I was actually sitting inside his steering wheel, just swinging <laughs> back and forth. Oh, I can remember this, and I saw this didn't know it was a handbrake and I just kind of grabbed it thought I was just gonna pull it and it popped forward oh no and I'm rolling backwards well I don't know what to do I'm <laughs> holding on it I can't move it and I remember looking up and my dad's in a full stride <laughs> running trying to catch this car that's pretty soon gonna go over a cliff you know that the oh, turn was pretty high up and um uh, he, but he made it. He dove through the windshield, the window, grabbed it, locked it up, and then he got the car stopped. And then I heard that very familiar sound of a belt coming through oh, no. belt loops. And uh, I have a very clear memory of the walk back <laughs> up to the house. And he uh, didn't want that to happen again. Yeah. Did, did you ever do that again? No, sir. Do you still think about that every time you see one of those brakes? <laughs> yeah, flashbacks of that I belt. Actually, yeah, I do. Over and over in the podcast, yeah. when I ask guys about memories they have about their dad, it's just everyday stuff that happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just the mundane. It's yeah. just the, the everyday, just being there, going through life together. Yeah. That's what what being a parent is all about. Yes. You didn't, you're five years, six years old. It's hard to understand. Yeah. At what point did you kind of comprehend, hey, this is, dad's <sighs> yeah. gone? Yeah. Um, when he passed back in those days, they would lie and stay at your house. Mm-hmm. So when Dad passed, they brought him back to our house, moved the couch out, put the casket there, and spent the night there. You know, one night, and it was just—I think I just sort of disconnected, and I, I never cried. Even at the funeral, I never cried. I remember seeing him there. Yeah, I have a very clear memory of the day that that day when they lowered his casket into that hole. And it was raining. We were under a canopy, obviously, but rain water running into that grave. And I was like, mm. "They're putting my dad in there." It's like I couldn't understand why. You yeah. know, that picture to this day is very clear. You know, and I just I never cried. It never seemed like it bothered me. Um, and then, I, of course, I went sleepwalking, and I think that whole episode lasted two, three months. Yeah. And then I think I just crashed one day, just volunteers. Just and, finally hit you. 
I think you told me at one time there was a point in your life where you came to a point where you said you, you made a conscious decision. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you, you kind of said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be the dad that I need to be for my kids. Yeah. Um, that was probably when I was 24. Um, I'd gotten married, um, early, too early. Uh, I mean, uh, some of my youthful mistakes um, from that marriage. I had two small children, two two daughters, and uh, I love them dearly, obviously. Um, but as as the birth of my first daughter was coming on, I was running from God. Mom was my very first Sunday school teacher. She brought me to church every Sunday. And so I knew right from wrong, and I knew who God was. And and so as the birth of my first daughter was coming, I was under conviction about it. I was like, oh, gosh, I, I know he's real. I'm just avoiding him. And um, <clears throat> I just clearly remember being in church, um, White Springs Baptist Church, matter of mm-hmm. fact, and uh, – don't even remember what Lewis Haney was preaching that day, but uh, I was strongly convicted with God speaking to me, saying, what are you going to do with me? That was clear in my mind, you know. What are you going to do with me? And I just lost it right there. I just I went to the front. I grabbed a good friend, Marvin Greer, and I said, will you pray with me? You know, I got to know. I mean, I, I've got to know. And... <laughs> He did, and uh, he uh, he became very instrumental in my life later, and uh, he, uh, he he mentored me. And there was a group of men there at the church that kind of took you in. Absolutely, that, that I point. saw something in these men that um that I didn't have, you know, and um, well, I could name the men right now, you know, mm-hmm. um, and they had a strong big impact on my life, and and um. And then Marvin stepping in that gap and mentoring me and putting material in my hand and uh, seeing that I was in church. Um, yeah, that was that was the turnaround. And um, I uh, had made a decision that I'm following Christ. That's, that's it. And um, that became a conflict with my wife at that point. Um mm-hmm. We weren't equally yoked at that point, and mm-hmm. I'm sold out, and that created a, a problem. And um, I wasn't turning back. Yeah. You know? And so I guess um, eventually she left, and I uh, uh, was divor- found myself divorced and uh, with these sharing custody of these two little girls. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was a very difficult one. Very and difficult time. I want to ask you to speak to the young man who's lost his dad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have Colin is one of our producers, <laughs> lost his dad mm-hmm. five years ago. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of young men who've lost their dad. I spoke at a church just recently, and a guy mm-hmm. came up and said he had lost his dad as a child. I've I've never experienced that, but mm-hmm. can you just speak to that and maybe um, – Share some of your experience and insight as to how do you deal with it. How did you overcome that anger that you had? How did you work through that confusion? Yeah. It wasn't quick, I know. But right. d- if you would just speak to that, to that young man that may be wondering, wow, you know, I'm, you know, I'm eight years old and I don't have a daddy. Yeah. I, uh, how I do I deal with this? I think it's very different from – six-year-old's perspective of losing their dad versus someone that's 20 or older when they lose their dad obviously um as a child everything's confusing and and you don't know how to let that out so that's how i reacted i had anger and it took it took me growing up maturing to be able to overcome that um if you were older i sometimes always i've I've thought that it would probably be harder to lose your dad when you were older I, i just from experience of watching people around me that's lost their fathers when it's older. Um, the only hope I can offer you there is Christ. Mm. That's the only hope. I mean, there's a lot of how-tos and 
10 ways of making this work out yeah. for you, but I, I think Christ is the only answer when it comes to those types of questions, when those big questions come along. Um, that's just one of many things that we have to deal with as, as, as adults, uh, maybe divorce is maybe one of them, maybe the loss of a child, which I couldn't comprehend, the loss of a father. Uh, those things, God is just as there then as he is as any other problem you might experience. But um, that's the only solution that I see, that resting in him and, and a, 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 just letting your fears lie with him and uh, take a step back breathe so tell us about your wife uh my wife kathy and i've been married for 31 years now got it 31 she's in the studio with us by the she way is. she's not on the she's microphone looking at me right now. um yeah she is awesome uh she is she is she is my rock as i said before uh it takes a lot of courage for a young lady that's never been married to uh, marry someone that already had had two children and becoming an immediate stepmother. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but she's been there through thick and thin and, uh, she's never faltered in her faith or her devotion. She, uh, she loves my kids as much as, uh, we, she does our kids. We have two daughters. So I have four daughters. Yeah. And, um, she has never faltered in her in her ability to see the problem clearer than I can, and she knows how to speak to me. Yeah, <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know how I can make it without her. And y'all been committed to each other. And that's so important. Absolutely. What do you think it takes to be a great dad? To be a great dad, I think primarily, I would think. Love your spouse. Love your spouse and be unified with your spouse when it comes to faith and discipline for your children. Be that model, role model in the family and your your wife and you are locked together in discipline and in faith and this is how it's good. And it doesn't have to be uh like rules and regulations around the house, it's actually a home of, full of love and care, and it's the way God wanted it to be. You know, that gives your kids a sense of security. It does. Because if they're always wondering, well, what you know, are they going to stay together? Am I going to mm-hmm. be? What's going to happen to me if that this doesn't work out? It gives your kids a sense of insecurity. Absolutely. I, I want to give you an opportunity to do something we always do. Um, obviously, your dad is gone. And you had some people step in, so I want to give you an opportunity to, um, to to say thank you to your yeah. dad or or some yeah. other people along the way too. If you'll look into that camera right there, don't look at me. <laughs> and I just want you to. Okay. I'd like so. for you to just take a yeah. minute to pour your heart out. Sure. Okay. Well, Dad. Though we didn't have much time together, uh, and I know you probably know this by now, but you played a huge part in my life. Uh, your example, your role model. So, Dad, thank you. you you've shaped me um, to whatever man I am today. Uh, all growing up, I never forgot you, and and I know you're a believer, and I know you're in heaven, and I know one day I'll get to see you. Really, the reason we do that is because I want these young men to see that you don't know how much time you've got with your kids. You don't. You don't. I mean, any of us could be wiped out tomorrow. Yeah. And so if you're a young father and you heard what Jerome said, his dad didn't know he only had six six years with him. Yeah. And I want you to know that those six years may be all you have, mm. yeah. but it's an opportunity to invest in your son or your daughter and that's something that they will never forget. So don't waste another day. Don't think I've got 18 years. Uh, yeah. You know, you may not have that long. So invest all you've got while you can. So you've you've had some little nippets of time, and you've had some impact on on your daughters. And we were able to capture a little bit of that. We want to 
we want to share that with you as we close. So what is the best thing about my dad? Wow. Everything, everything. My dad is the most awesome father ever. He's always been there for us. He's got four daughters. He's always been there for all of us. He's tried to guide us the best way he can. He has instilled God in us to a level. It's, it's just amazing. He's taught us how to love, how to care, how to be consistent. He's always been there. He's. It doesn't matter what I go through or what I put him through. If I call him, he's always there and he's always giving me the best advice. Um, I remember one time when we were, when I was younger, we went to the beach and I remember me and my dad just going to this little restaurant, just him and I, and we got a little bowl of clam chowder and we shared this little bowl of clam chowder while we just sat there and talked. It was a, a, a nice memory for me and I enjoyed that moment. And there's so many more stories that I could tell you know, my dad is so adventurous. He is just this amazing, fun man who just brings joy and light to everybody. Anybody who knows my dad, everybody who's ever met my dad knows my dad is awesome. Dad, I thank you. I just thank you for being there. I just thank you for showing me that you care, that you love me. You're the best dad in the entire world. I could never ask for a better dad. I love you, and I thank you for just being that amazing. Mwah. All right, so the thing that I love best about my dad, or one of the things that I love about my dad, um, he is the definition of a man's man. He knows how to take anything apart and put it back together, probably better than it was before. Um, he could survive if you dropped him off in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Uh, he knows all of the things and how to survive. Uh, he probably knows 45,000 different ways to start a fire. <laughs> um, but more importantly, he is such a great example of what a godly man should be. He has countlessly pointed me to the gospel. Um, he's a man of integrity. Um, he says what he means. He means what he says. And if he says he's going to do something, you can absolutely count on it happening. Um, my favorite story about my dad, gosh, I, I don't know if that I could just pick one. Um, in general, my dad is a great storyteller. Um, he can make anything sound so interesting. I learn so much when I'm around him. Uh, and I love listening to his stories or even just listening to him explain something. Um, some of my favorite stories are when he talks about the memories he has with his dad. He passed away when he was six. Um, just growing up and learning how to do things on his own. Um, like buying his first truck, figuring out, figuring out how to drive a manual as he's driving it off the lot. <laughs> um, being, in a, being a drummer for a rock and roll band back in high school what I would give to be able to listen to Magnum <laughs> back in the day. That would be awesome. Um, let's see, some of my, my favorite memories that I have with him are probably some, some of them are centered around our, what we call red truck conversations. Uh, growing up, he drove an old red pickup truck and anytime I rode with him, we were bound to have a heart to heart. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Dad, I want to thank you for um, being a good listener, um, always pointing me and reminding me of the truth, um, taking your time, giving me your time uh, to teach me things or explain things to me, um, and just being available anytime I call or um, want to talk or need to talk, um, just being there. So thank you so much. I love you so much. I think my favorite thing about dad is, uh, well, he's kind of unique in that he didn't have an example to follow as far as being a dad goes with his dad having died pretty young. Um, and I think he always wanted someone to just teach him a lot of things, uh, particularly like guy things. Um, and I feel kind of like, um, the son he never had <laughs> uh, with being the one to go hunting with him and fishing or things like that that we enjoyed. Um, but I appreciate that he uh, wanted to teach us things that he didn't, he wasn't necessarily taught, but he learned 
and um, yeah, to give us what he didn't have. Um, so that's one thing that I really like about dad. Um, a favorite memory of my dad would be, um, I know that my sister already used Red Truck Conversations as a <laughs> uh, example, but one in particular that I always remember and think is really funny is uh, we used to ask dad ridiculous questions that he would give a silly scientific explanation of. And so one of those that happened in a red truck conversation was we asked him, um, why do leaves fall off of trees? And he was like, you don't know why leaves fall off of trees. <laughs> and he was like, well, obviously it's because ants need to make it down to the ground quickly sometimes. And so they will hold on to a leaf and sort of parachute down and land safely and quickly. Um, and so that's just a really funny memory uh, of dad just kind of being goofy with us growing up and he's still goofy for sure. Um, but then on a serious note, dad, thanks for, um, I think you, whether knowingly or unknowingly, uh, taught us a lot about how we can relate to and um, bring things to our Heavenly Father. Um, yeah, I think your demeanor and I think just a calmness about you and an understanding sort of nature that you have. Um, I've always known that I could bring anything to you, whether it was like good things or, or bad things. Um, I could share things with you. Um, and you've received me really well, um, and patiently and graciously. Um, yeah, I know that no matter what I could ever do, that you would still love me. Um, not that you would approve of all of some things that I've done before. Um, but I know that I can bring them to you. And I think that that mirrors, um, how we can relate to our heavenly father that um it's never too late to repent it's never too late to you know bring bring things to the lord um and we can bring all kinds of things to the lord we can bring good things and and hard things and confess our sins to the lord too um so you are never a person that i i couldn't come to um so i'm i'm really thankful for that and that's just honestly a really impactful thing i think so yeah, thank you, Dad. I love you. That's amazing. Thank you. So, Jerome. You got me there, Scott. <laughs> You've worked hard, Jerome. I've, it's been my pleasure to be your friend oh, for this, this journey. But you deserve every minute of the praise that your kids gave you tonight. And so it's, it's thrilling to me. You know, I kind of shed a tear or two because I, I was there and I've yes. seen you. I've seen you pour your heart out and give it to your kids and you deserve every minute of that. So, hope we've inspired somebody. Thank you for coming and My pleasure, Scott. joining thank us. You. And thank, thank you for your friendship and all that you've done for the kids at Eagle Rock and a lot of other kids that aren't at Eagle Rock. So, uh, appreciate you. Yes, sir. All Thank right, hope, hope we've inspired somebody. That'll conclude this episode of That's My Dad, where we're trying to inspire young fathers to become great dads and trying to break cycles of generational fatherlessness. So until next week, we'll see you then. <laughs>